Hello, my name is Richard. I work in the pre-breeding group here at Naya. Um, we're currently in the John McLeod Glasshouse Complex in one of our seasonal glasshouses. Um, and today I'll talk you through some of the work that we're involved in in the pre-breeding group. The main focus of our work um, for the last 10 years has been to produce pre-breeding lines that contain novel genetic diversity from the two progenitor species of wheat. Um, if we briefly remind ourselves of the history of wheat and how it was formed, um, wheat is a result of many natural crosses between different grasses. Um, the, the most recent cross was estimated to happen about 10,000 years ago when a wild emma wheat, which contributes a tetra <coughs> genome of bread wheat, naturally crossed to a goat grass or Aetilops tauchii. We've taken two approaches in order to capture the genetic diversity of both of those progenitor species. Uh, my colleague Fiona Lee has focused her efforts on the tetraploid side. She's managed to source a collection of 50 wild tetraploid donors and she's directly crossed those to Robigus and Paragon, um, which are two elite wheat varieties. Um, and you'll see more about her work later on in the field today. I have concentrated my efforts on the D genome on the goat grass, um, we can't actually directly cross a goat grass into, uh, into elite wheat, so I have to make a synthetic wheat and use the synthetic wheat as a vehicle to transfer the genetic diversity from the D genome into modern wheat cultivars. So essentially what I'm doing is recreating that cross that happened an estimated 10,000 years ago. So we have successfully managed to resynthesize 50 novel synthetic wheats each with a novel goat grass donor. And it's the, the, the goat grass, the D genome, that we're hoping to exploit in our field populations. In order to generate those field populations, we need to cross our synthetic wheat into two UK elite wheat varieties. Um, we've picked Paragon and Robigus, Paragon being a spring wheat and Robigus being a winter wheat. Um, we make the first cross, which produces the F1 seed, we grow on the F1 seed and then we cross it again to Robigus or Paragon to produce a BC1 generation. We then sell for BC1 generation through to BC1 F5 and that's the last generation that we see here in the glasshouses. So the field material that we're going to see later will all be BC1 F6 material. But I have some examples of some of the um, later generations that we've produced. This is, these are BC1 F5 plants um, and already you can see some of the improvements that we get from processing synthetic wheat into our elite wheat. So if we compare the year of this back cross um, pre-breeding line to the year of our elite paragon, you can see that there's already a substantial improvement in the size of the year, the size of the grain and the grain number. Um, and we also see similar improvement in trades such as tillering. Obviously tillering, seed size and seed number are very key yield components. And they're very important for breeders. Um, and we can demonstrate that we're able to improve some of these key traits. All of the crossing that we've done for this project is what we call conventional crossing. Um, and by that I mean that I've sat down and manually removed the anthers and then sprinkled on the pollen from the pollen donor. And I can demonstrate to you now exactly how we emasculate our plants. First of all, we need to choose a suitable ear. Um, and generally speaking, I like to pick one that's about 50% emerged from the flag leaf. <clears throat> and then we unroll it from the flag leaf to expose the spikelets. So the ear is often called the spike. Uh, these structures are spikelets and each spikelet will contain three florets, two outer florets and a central floret. I begin by moving the smallest of the spikelets and then carefully remove the central floret, like so. And we do that all the way to the top and on both sides of the year. Once we've removed the central florets, we need to cut down the two outer florets to expose the anthers. Um, I tend to cut just below halfway. Um, if you cut, cut too high, it's much harder to extract the anthers. 
So don't be afraid to cut a little bit low. So now we can see that in each of those two outer florets there will be three anthers and now it's just simply a case of carefully removing those anthers whilst not damaging the stigma and we obviously continue that process for each of the florets. We then bag the ear to prevent any pollen contaminating our cross. Leave it a couple of days until the stigma becomes receptive and then we can pick the pollen that we want to make the cross with um, to complete the cross.